My name is Jeffrey Tucker. I'm at the Mises Institute, and today I'm interviewing Robert Murphy, who's an economist, um, and uh, we're going to be talking about one chapter from this new edition of Economics and One Lesson, a book that was published in 1946, republished now, um, and just as relevant as ever. And uh, Dr. Murphy, the subject uh, of the chapter we're discussing is uh, has to do with jobs mm -hmm. and technology, right? Right. And the title of the chapter is the curse of machinery. The curse of machinery. Okay. So, what does Hazlitt mean by the curse of machinery? Well, he's referring to the fact, and he and he shows that it's gone back uh, far back in history that any time a new technique is developed that is a, a labor-saving device, that people fear it because they think, oh, you're throwing people out of work. And so machinery is a curse because it's just causing unemployment. And so therefore, we ought to resist the introduction of new machines, sometimes with the caveat, unless the machine doesn't save labor. So as long as it's not putting people out of work, then sometimes people say, OK, a new machine's a good thing. But if it causes the firm to lay off some people because now we have the machine doing the job of 10 men, then that's obviously bad. That's the, the And he the talks idea. about the Industrial Revolution and mm -hmm. how this was a controversy back. But even now, it's a controversy. Right. Even about the Industrial Revolution, you still read people say, well, you know, it was really regrettable. You know, it took people off these, the wonderful, uh, their happy lives on their, on their landed, uh, landed uh, plots there, mm -hmm. and they drove them to the city. Right. And he, so he goes through it. And he, I like what he does in the chapter. So first, he just quotes people to make sure you believe he's not setting up a straw man. Uh -huh. He just quotes people after people saying just what you've said. Yeah. And people fall away from up to Eleanor Roosevelt saying, well, yeah, in the past it was okay, but now this is really <laughs> serious. Like, during the Depression, this is serious. And yeah, people just, they have these false views about what happened in the past, and he goes through his statistics to show, well, actually, in a lot of these industries, with the new machines, for example, the automobile industry, obviously, there were more people employed in there in 1960 than in 1920. Right. And so clearly the introduction of machinery didn't, but he goes through and, and just shows those examples, and then, but then sort of makes makes the point also that, look, in the terms of the industrial revolution, in a sense, the population would have all starved to death if they didn't have all this new machinery coming into place. And so, in a real sense, it created jobs because there are people working right now. It's not that there's 99% unemployment, and most of those people would be dead if it weren't for the right. industrial revolution. So he goes through and traces the effects, um, and there. The effects are somewhat unpredictable, aren't they, from new machinery? It can right. cause an expansion of an industry, but it can also cause its complete uh, elimination and displacement, right, of an well, industry. Well, right. So do you have you have in mind that the the horse and buggies go out of business because right. of the car? Right. Yeah. He. So Hazlitt, he doesn't. That, I mean, that's certainly one effect. But he, what he's really trying to focus in on is the even sillier fallacy of in an industry that benefits from the machinery, uh -huh. so that. They still make the same product, but now they use machines to do it. But you're, but you're right. He he makes the point that sometimes advocates on our side of this issue go too far, and they just stress the long-term net effects on in general, and how everyone must be richer per capita, which is obviously true. With machines, more stuff's getting produced, so obviously per person there's more stuff to be consumed. But it is possible that individual laborers, if you spent your whole life learning a trade, and then a machine comes along that does your job, you might be worse off for a few years. Right. And so it's good that he he, he, catch, he dots all the I's and crosses all the T's and, and makes sure he catches uh, all the It's quite threads. systematic, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, a lot of this we can understand from our own work lives. In fact, that probably everybody can understand it at some level because mm -hmm. um, we've all benefited enormously from in the last 15, 20 years. Actually, uh, almost daily, sure. there are new things that help us. Right. I mean, it's, it's gotten to the point now where the anti-capitalist criticism is, you know, oh, give me a break. You know, I, I want to just be able to go on vacation and not have my boss be able to get in touch with me. And I just could turn off all my pagers. <laughs> or I was a consumer. I have too many choices. And you go into McDonald's and there's 16 different value menus. And, and so, yeah, now it's almost like they, even the people who hate capitalism can't with a straight face say it's, it's hard, it impoverished us. Now they have to say we're overwhelmed with all these choices yeah. and all these gadgets that don't really help us. Uh, and yet, um, I'm sure you've I had this experience of talking to people and the subject of you know computers and software and it's always an interesting dinner mm -hmm. dinner time conversation come up and there'll always be somebody that says something like well you know I really regret a lot of this in many ways because you know we've just become this nation in which um, unless you know how to use a computer um, there's nothing for you to do and right. there's lots of people who just cannot and will not do this and what's going to become of them right 
And yeah, I mean, what, at some point, there, there's always ways you can try to show. Well, no, even anybody, I mean, even someone, like if you have you seen it in the fast food restaurants now, like some of the the terminals, they just have pictures of the value uh -huh. meal, and so I mean, like they, they really just do everything business needs to do to cater to any type of you know human being of any sort. Like, how can we adapt to to use this person to to integrate them into the social nexus of cooperation? Uh -huh. But but you're right. I mean, ultimately, if there is somebody that just refuses to learn, I mean, what if someone just said, I don't want to, I don't want to use language? What are you going to do about that? And right. is that a vexing social problem? Well, I don't know, but. It's, you know, this is all voluntary decisions happening, and if the great majority are benefiting, we're not forcing you to not use computers. We're saying right. we're going to use computers, and if you're free to use them if you want to. Doesn't it seem like you meet more and more people, though, that um, are very successful at what they do, but are doing something that they weren't trained to do at all in college? Doesn't it seem more and more common now? I, th I think so. I mean, I don't, I don't know historically what the difference yeah. would be, but, but certainly, yeah, I mean, I'm... I'm not doing exactly right now what I thought I was going to be doing. Right. I thought I was going to be at a college, you know, teaching classes, and, right. and I'm not doing that right now. And I, but I love what I'm doing. And yeah, you're right. Uh, plenty of people I talk to, it's it's almost a joke. I don't even ask people anymore what's your major because I know it's just that's more like just saying what are your hobbies <laughs> at this point. It has nothing to do. <laughs> now I ask people like, yeah. do you know what you're going to do with your career? It, it, even that's not the right phrase anymore because that right. just makes it sound like, oh, I'm going to go work for IBM for my life, and right. nobody thinks like that. Nobody anymore. thinks like that. But don't you have some sense? Of course, we weren't around. Mm -hmm. But don't you have some sense that sometime after World War II, there was this perception that well, your life is really laid out right. for you. You know, mm -hmm. you go to school, you learn a particular trade, you land in that trade, and you work in that thing. You do the same thing until you retire and get the grandfather clock, and that's it. Sure. Yeah, I I grew up in Rochester, New York, yeah. and that I think its title was the imaging capital of the world because it had IBM and Xerox and Kodak were headquartered mm -hmm. there, and yeah, they're people would be when I growing you know in the 80s is when I started really becoming politically aware and then the letters to the editor were because Kodak was downsizing so was IBM yeah, right. and all the letters were talking about how it used to be that you know there was loyalty and you put in your hours in the company you know and you they had your pension and everything and now we're just outsourcing and now it's all about the bottom line and so yeah certainly people <laughs> say that it used to be this understanding that when yeah. you went to work for yeah. IBM or Kodak that was it and, and, it was an been, understanding. and the pace of the technological changes mm -hmm. is, is, is seems to be uh, growing I mean it's accelerating is what I mean to say um, and and yet it's it's it makes life more interesting doesn't it I mean can you imagine doing the same darn thing ever. We live in a world of relentless change. Oh, for sure. And, and I, th I mean, I love it. I, I do too, and it, it's partly my personality. I have, uh, I, I don't mean uh, to, to say this too glibly, but I think I have attention deficit yeah. disorder, and yeah, I can't... Yeah. Well, we all do. <laughs> yeah, the, the, idea, the idea of just doing one thing for 30 years just seems inconceivable to me, so you're, so you're right, and it's uh, and this technological progress, it, it is accelerating, yeah. and, and we just take for granted that Every, you know, we get every time we buy a new computer that's supposed to do things, then something little happens. Then I do this too, and I get so mad and say, "Do computers even save time?" And I get all frustrated <laughs> because the Excel formula didn't get imported into Word properly yeah, when right. when I was growing up. I mean, just to get a hard drive was like, "Oh wow, there's a hard drive. This is amazing!" And you know, wow. I upgrade to 640 RAM kilobytes of RAM. This is amazing. And now, you know, I have more than that in my phone. And yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's what, really amazing. What about the next? Chapter that uh, is titled uh, "Spread the Work." Spread the what is a spread the work scheme? Is this an anachronism these days or no? No, I don't think it's an anachronism because most of the examples. So the spread the work scheme is just the idea that there's a fixed amount of work to be done, and so it would be unfair, you know, left to their own devices. These greedy businessmen would have just picked the the most efficient laborers, the ones that they could give the lowest wages to, and they would do all the work, and everyone else would be out of a job. And so we need to have the government or unions come in and put rules in place to, to spread this fixed amount of work around to make sure everyone gets some pay and gets some work and that, you know, that would allow there to be more consumer spending and things like that. So that's the idea. And no, most of the examples Hazlitt gives are things like uh, federal rules on overtime pay. He said part of the motivation, the explicit motivation for that when they put those rules into place was we want to give businessmen an, an incentive not, you know, if they have 80 hours of work to be done, don't give it all to the most productive guy. Give you know forty hours to one person and forty hours to somebody else. So it wasn't about human rights. It was just a, a sort of a silly. Right. He thing. yeah has let it clarify. He said some of those things were an issue like out, you know, prohibitions on child labor and things like that. He yeah. said he thinks a lot of the motivation was a sort of this is unseemly. But he said nobody thought working fifty hours a week was going to physically break someone's back, and that you know the the precise quantitative amounts for some of these things were clearly and explicitly ideas of. 
during the depression and what have you. You know, we got to really spread the work around. Involve as many people, yeah. people right. as possible in the production. Right, process. and then and then he just goes through and quotes all these ridiculous union regulations, things that I I know are still in force today. Maybe not the specifics, but the idea that there needs to be the electrician on site to, to screw in a light bulb. I mean, really ridiculous things where yeah. they can't, someone can't do the work of someone else yeah. or else you have to like pay him an extra day's wages and you have to pay the guy who should have right. done it and just all these crazy things. You to, encounter that in mm -hmm. large cities even now. I mean, just absurd. Right, yeah. I mean, I, I just even when I was growing up, I, I worked at, at, in a factory at Kodak for a while and I used to hear horror stories about guys. I mean, they, they weren't ideological. They were just joking around like, yeah, listen to this crazy story about... Just things like it, you know, they had two more minutes left of work to do on this job, but oh, it's lunchtime. We got to go to lunch, yeah, and then right. the guy was saying, "Well, why don't we just finish this and be done with it?" No, no, and then you know, so then that whole section of the factory was shut down for another two hours because they had to go to lunch and come back just to do two yeah. minutes of work. Right. And you know, if that were, if there weren't these official regulations, obviously. So we live with these mm -hmm. with the remnants of this fallacy, but is the fallacy itself itself still around? Do you hear it? Uh. I guess it, I don't. I don't think I hear it as much now as, as Hazlitt seems to make it sound it, it being prevalent then. I mean, some of the other stuff in his book about, um, you know, the benefits of a of a, of a tornado, get boosting GDP because now we have to rebuild. I mean, those sorts of things, the broken window fallacy. I see a lot more now. The spread the work idea, it's still embedded in in union propaganda, but I haven't heard. I haven't seen that being. Trump but I haven't much. asked you what's wrong with it. What's wrong with actually spread the with works? With spread the works? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, it's We're good just because, assuming that this is stupid, right because we know it's, it's yeah we know it's wrong. Yeah, but yeah, it, it is, and that's again just to, to plug Hazlitt's book. Yeah. He, you know, the stuff's got to be wrong. But he just goes through and says, well, let's let's make sure we understand why it's wrong. And, right. and yeah, with this, he says, okay, so let's say the government um, or the, or the union or what have you just sets up a rule where okay, now there's a certain amount of people working, and why don't we say you have to work? 75% of the hours you used to, and that and that's the rule. And he said there's two ways, you know, two things that can happen. So if the, if we allow the business to cut wages, and so that they're you know the workers who used to be employed working so so much now earn 75% in their paycheck, he said, well then you know you haven't all you've done is they're giving some of their money to the to the people who now fill the gap in, and so it's not that society's richer and you're just you're benefiting one group at the expense of the other. You're not helping labor because obviously the workers who now get their hours cut back are worse off. Right. And then he said, on the other hand, if if you insist that no, no, you had let's cut back their hours, but you still have to give them the same gross paycheck every week, and then also then decide what you want to do if you want to hire more workers. Well, then clearly that's going to cause unemployment that you've in effect you know put in a, a wage control, and and that you're forcing the employer to pay more per hour than he originally wanted to. And so that's going to cause them to, to hire fewer workers. And obviously, and so in an attempt to help workers, you're just throwing people out of work. It would be no different from just saying, why don't you just increase pay by 25%? And we and we can think through why that wouldn't help workers in yeah. general. Yeah. So it's, it's again, it just you just say in, in the original equilibrium before this intervention, things were the way they were for a certain reason. And, and even there, he has clarified that this is under the most generous assumptions that really what happens is the people who are working the most are the most productive. And so if you arbitrarily say you can't work as much and give that job to somebody else, then the total amount of output drops because now right. you're giving the work to people who aren't as That's efficient. Right. It's, it is an example of government regulations creating people as some sort of uh, acting as if all workers are homogeneous. Right, you know? right. Uh, in, 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 in this and then in the previous chapter too, The Curse of Machinery, he stresses over and over that one of the main things that's wrong with this is this idea that there's a set amount of work that needs to be done and right. who's going to do it. When, no, in general, if wages can adjust, you can hire as many people as want to work. And so then the issue is not, there's a, these are the tasks to be done, who's going to do it? But no, different tasks can be done. I mean, labor's scarce and you put workers into where they're most highly needed. And then if more machinery comes in, oh, great, now we can do more stuff. Right. We can accomplish more things. And so you always channel workers to where they're needed most on the margin. And this observation that there's always work to do isn't just uh, an empirical observation of a certain time and a place, but it's always true, always and everywhere, isn't it? Right, yeah. I mean, we, you could, I suppose, come up with crazy scenarios if there were 10 trillion people and someone would be, you know, uh, it would, labor would no longer be scarce. But, yeah, it, this is clearly, <laughs> yeah. uh, in any practical sense, there's yeah. always more work to be done. That it's The reason people stop working is because on the margin they say, you know what, my leisure is more important. It's yeah. not because 
there's absolutely nothing that right. human creativity right. and a pair of hands couldn't contribute to create more output the consumers yeah. would want. Yeah. That, that that never happens. Because we don't live in a utopia. Right, right. right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Murphy, for your wonderful talk. Oh, thanks for having me.